today we're going to be talking about states of consciousness or unconsciousness, depending on the point that you're at right now. Hopefully you're not going to look like this by the end of the lecture, but hey, who knows? It is about consciousness. Quite often we fall asleep in the middle of it. So let's kind of get a definition of what consciousness is. And consciousness is when we are kind of aware of our sensations and perceptions and these things that are going on, like our brain is working and our our feet are working and our hearing is working. All of that is your consciousness. And we break it into two types, waking and altered. So in waking, that's when I'm aware of everything and I'm alert. I know that I'm listening to something. I know that I'm walking. Altered states of consciousness, ASCs, those tend to be things that happen um, that make us not completely aware. So good examples of those are things like sleep, um, it may be daydreaming, because if you think about it, when you're daydreaming, you're not completely aware of everything that's happening around you. So if we really think about this, we spend a lot of time in ASC, uh, a lot of time in an altered state of consciousness, simply because of sleep. So since sleep is our largest altered state of consciousness, let's talk about that first and what the function of sleep is. And the biggest function for sleep is, is that it is the time that we restore our body functions. It is the time that we allow our brain chemicals to restore. If we're injured, it's the time that that body gets restored. If you're a kid, it's the time that you sleep. It's the time that you grow. So we need to sleep. Now, sleep deprivation will cause us to react in certain ways. And many of you have been through sleep deprivation. And once we get into four or more days of sleep deprivation, we begin to really have problems. So when we start talking about deprived sleep, one of the things we have to talk about is something called microsleeps. And microsleeps are when the body says, look, you're not sleeping, I have to have sleep. And it's going to grab it when it can. So you may have experiences at school or you may have experiences at work where you're listening to somebody and you just kind of nod down for a second. And you're like, oh my gosh, I just fell asleep for a second. Well, that happens because basically your brain is saying you have to sleep and you haven't been sleeping. And so I'm going to grab the sleep whenever I can. Well, that's fine if you're sitting at a desk. It's not fine if you're behind a wheel of a car. And microsleeps are something that's happening more and more to people because they're getting less and less sleep. The problem is, is that, and don't hold me to this because I can't remember where I saw the statistics, but that DUI, people dying from DUIs and people dying because of someone falling asleep behind the wheel of the car are almost equal now in the United States. And so we have a lot of people getting into cars while they're sleepy, while they're tired. And because sleep doesn't require a lot of activity, we know we can kind of almost do it in our sleep. Um, we find the brain is falling asleep. In many states now, if it can be proven that you knew you were sleepy before you got behind that wheel of the car, they can go ahead and prosecute you for manslaughter because you knew you were in an altered state, you knew you were in an impaired state, but yet you chose to get behind the wheel of the car anyway. The other sleep deprivation is sleep deprivation psychosis. Now, this sometimes happens and sometimes doesn't happen, but basically what we're talking about now is somebody who's going for a long period of time, and we're talking about days now on end without sleep. And we've seen this a couple of times on radio shows where people have stayed up all night to do marathons or um, contestants have to put their hand on a car and whoever takes their hand off last um, you know wins the car but what will happen is is that because they've gone without sleep for days on end they begin to hallucinate and they begin to see things that are not there they get very confused about what they're doing now the n odd thing is is that it doesn't happen all the time it may happen to you it may not happen to you the person who holds the Guinness World Book of Records for the most hours of staying awake, in this case it was days of staying awake, did not suffer sleep deprivation psychosis. And yet other people have absolutely suffered it. So it's sort of a hit or miss there. Not quite certain why some do and some don't. I'm often asked about how much sleep do we need. Now, I got this from the National Institute of Health. It's not in your book, but it's usually information people are interested in. And this kind of really shows you how much sleep we need. And you'll notice basically up to your teen years, you're going to need a lot of sleep. Even teens need eight and a half to 10 hours of sleep. So why do our preschoolers and our school age kids need so much sleep? Look at that. You're 12 years old. You still need 10 to 11 hours of sleep. 
Well, it's a very simple reason. Our bodies are still growing. And remember, it's during sleep when growth occurs. So letting your middle schoolers stay up till 11 or 12 o'clock at night is not doing them any good. They need that sleep in order for their brains and their bodies to fully grow. Now, once we hit 18 or, you know, whatever our full body cycle is. Some people may hit it by the time they're 17. Some may take till 21. But once we hit an adult body, we've got the adult brain, we've got the adult body, we can reduce down to seven and a half to nine hours of sleep depending on the individual. Until then, people need to sleep. So don't let your 10 year olds stay up. Don't let your 12 year olds stay up. They need to go to bed if you want their brains and their bodies to grow properly. Now, how do we know people are sleeping? Well, we use EEGs and we look at brain waves. And this is just kind of a nice little diagram here so you can see what some of the different brain waves would look like. So beta wave is usually what we're in right now. Hopefully you're in a beta wave. You're very active. You're um, alert. Hopefully you're awake. And if you are, then if I was to get to an EKG, this is what we'd see. Now, what's interesting is, is that alpha waves, which are basically when we're relaxed, don't look very relaxed, do they? But they are. Think about them as being very slow up very slow down where this is very jiggity boop, 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 really fast so this is kind of like running and this is a slow little walk up and down so in alpha we're relaxed um, we can get to this state alpha waves through meditation some drugs can get us into alpha waves now data waves delta waves I'm sorry delta waves are basically our deep sleep and if we're in pure delta waves we may even be in a dreamless sleep but in delta we will see some dream dreaming occurring um, and we will see some sleep occur. Now theta waves are sort of in between alpha and delta and you've been in theta waves when you've been sitting on the couch maybe and you're really relaxed and you're not quite asleep but you're not quite awake either you're just kind of drifty. There's a good chance right then you were in theta waves. So I ask you to go over and turn to the figure 5.5 .5 in your textbook. It's really a good figure. It does is it shows you the four stages of sleeps that we have. And it kind of shows you the pattern of time when we go down and when we come up. We'll address this a lot more in class. I'm going to kind of go through it quickly here. One of the big things about stage one sleep we have to remember is that the first time we go through, we have something called the hypnic jerk that occurs. And basically, these are muscle twitches. And you know this twitch if you've ever woken up and you felt like you're about to fall you were just about to fall asleep and then you wake up I'm falling I'm falling you basically had a big hypnic jerk your whole body twitched and your body had to try to interpret what that twitch was and to it it was falling if you'll notice while you wake up kind of panic that you're gonna fall you also fall right back to sleep pretty fast Stage two, we get into a deeper sleep. This is, we spend the least amount of time in stage two overall. Um, it's basically just a time period for us to, to sort of slow down even more. Stage three is actually um, the beginning of delta waves. And we stay a lot of time in stage three sleep compared to other sleeps. And down here, we've got this kind of neat little chart that shows you what stage three sleep is. Um, and we can see right here maybe this sleep period of uh, very deep sleep. That would be a stage four sleep. And what's going to happen is that as we get down into stage three and four, we begin to find our bodies getting more and more heavy and more and more relaxed and our sleep um, breaths get deeper and our heart rate slows down. And in fact, if you are woken up during stage four sleep, see I yawn every time. If you wake up during stage four sleep, you may find it actually very difficult to wake up. It could take you up to half an hour to kind of wake up because you are basically so relaxed and so deep in sleep. And the sleep chemicals are in your brain that they basically just take time to get out. So if you're looking at that chart, you'll notice it goes down into stage four and then comes up pretty rapidly to stage one. So yes, an hour nap might be nice, but if we really look at it, an hour and 15 is going to make you feel far more refreshed because you'll be waking up in stage one sleep. I admit I stole this from HowStuffWorks.com. This is a really nice little chart. Kind of puts everything together to let you see what it is. What I like is that they actually put the brainwave patterns kind of up here with the different stages. Um, as we said, stage one, 
the first time you go through stage one, it's very slight. Uh, stage two, we keep going. Now let's talk about dreaming here. Dreaming has a different pattern altogether, and we are dreaming about 20 to 25% of our sleep. One of the things that we do have to remember, though, is that we can dream in any stage. However, we dream most often in stage one sleep. Also during dreaming, during this, we have something called rapid eye movement or REM. It's more than the name of a musical group. It's actually a period of time during sleep. During REM sleep is when we're going to have our most vivid sleeping. So let's look a little bit more at REM and non-REM sleep. Non-REM is basically going to be any time we're not in REM sleep. Pretty simple. REM sleep is rapid eye movement sleep, and what we look at down here is we're having some REM sleep at this point. And remember, short means very fast and jiggy, and right there we can see the actual rapid eye movement occur. And so this is what you might see if you went to a sleep pattern or a sleep um, study center. They'd be having these little things on your head, and they'd be actually recording you and watching you sleep. Now, REM sleep is where we have our most vivid dreams. It is where those dreams that you think of as dreams occur. NREM does have dreams. It's only about 10% of the time do we dream in NREM. So it's not very often, but if we do dream, they tend to be very foggy dreams. Now, we'll talk a lot more about dreaming when you come to campus and more about interpretation of dreams at that point. So what is the function then of NREM? Well, the biggest thing for that is to help our bodies relax and for our bodies for healing. So we need to have NREM sleep to allow that to occur. But remember, we're pretty much dream free except for during about 10% of that time. But the neat thing about NREM sleep is that a lot of funny dream activities occur during this, including sleepwalking. Now, REM sleep is where we said we had our most vivid dreaming. Now, one of the big things that we need to understand is that the body is not only still during REM sleep, but we're semi-paralyzed. We don't really move very much. And that's probably because we would be un very unsafe if our body was moving and acting out what we're seeing um, in our dreams. I don't know if I would want to be uh, dreaming of dancing and then find myself physically up and dancing in my room when I'm asleep because I'd be hurting myself. So we tend to find that REM sleep we're semi-paralyzed and you've seen this maybe you've seen a dog dreaming of running and you saw just the paws move not the whole legs just the paws and we're gonna see a video about this too which is kind of interesting where some people um, uh, do move during REM sleep but it's generally not occurring. So we talk about sleep disturbances or when we don't sleep well. I have a couple of questions that people usually ask me about. And the first one is about insomnia. And one of the big things about insomnia is that people actually don't understand what it is. It is the difficulty of getting to sleep, but it is also nighttime awakening. So if one of those people who goes to sleep, but you get up, not because you have to pee, but you get up at, I don't know, one o'clock in the morning, and then you kind of go back to sleep and you wake up again at three o'clock in the morning, you go back to sleep and you wake up again at six o'clock in the morning you're getting up too early and you're not able to sleep all the way through the night, that is also insomnia. Now, most insomnia is temporary. It goes away. It's due to stress or excitement or maybe even a medication that you're taking. And the best way to sort of get over insomnia is to not fight it. If you're laying in bed and you're not sleeping, get up, get out of the bed, go do something else, go sit and watch TV or something. But the more that you lay in bed, the more you're training your body that you don't sleep in bed, that you're just there to lay. So most people who... Um, our experts in this field would tell you get up and get out of bed. The other thing with insomnia, especially here in the state of Florida, is that our body does go down in temperature when we go to sleep. And if I'm someplace that is very hot, I may find that my body temperature can't drop down and thus I can't go to sleep. So if you have one of those programmable thermostats, you might want to try programming it so that your house cools off for just an hour or two while you're going to sleep and then let it kind of go back up because once you're asleep, quite often you can stay asleep. This is also what happens during hurricane times why people can sometimes get so grumpy it's because if the electricity goes off, we don't have any way to cool our houses and it can be very hot and humid and boy, it can just be really hard for us to sleep. 
The other one that we kind of talk about is sleepwalking. And now sleepwalking can only occur in NREM, because remember in REM sleep we're semi-paralyzed so we can't be walking. So it's going to occur in NREM, which is generally in stages three and four. Um, we do other things in our sleep, including sleep talk. We also can have sleep sex. And yes, sleep eating does occur. By the way, sleep eating tends to happen mostly with teenage boys. They tend to just get really hungry. And even though they are asleep, they'll wander downstairs and grab themselves something to eat. Um, had a young lady, or oh, maybe not so young, had a, had a mother who talked about her teenage boy and sleep eating. And one of his favorite combinations was mayonnaise and peanut butter. Ugh. Um, but yeah, when you're sleep eating, you don't seem to really care about what you're eating. You just eat. Um, another lady who talked about her son eating um, when he was asleep that they would find this food put away in the cabinet afterwards that's true unfortunately the cabinet was often in the bathroom so it looked like he had picked up something to eat decided to go to the bathroom on the way back stuck it in the cabinet because after all the food goes back in the cabinet and she said you would find it in the strangest places but Sleep eating is something that can occur. The biggest thing that normally every student has to worry about is the fact that you can train yourself to do simple activities while you're asleep, including turning off your alarm clock. We literally have hooked people up and found that they did not wake up when they rolled over to turn off their alarm. So how can I help myself? Well, what most sleep experts would say is one, do not put the alarm clock near you. Put the alarm clock on the other side of the room. The fact that you have to get up and take a few steps, you have a greater chance of waking up. Not only that, but you may need to rotate your alarm clocks. If you are a person who keeps sleeping through the alarms, you need to have a new noise that you begin to say, oh, hey, that noise, I don't know what that is. Also, you should not have an alarm clock that goes off and then you can sleep until the next time it goes off and sleep until maybe the third time it goes off because all you're training yourself to do is say, I don't have to respond to that alarm clock right away. Nightmares and night terrors are totally two different things. Nightmares are bad dreams. They occur during REM sleep and generally they're vivid and they're scary and we wake up and our heart is pounding and oh, I don't want to go back to sleep. Night terrors, on the other hand, are something that occurs in stage three or four. Now, the reason that we know night terrors occur at a different stage is because people act out what they're dreaming. Now remember, a nightmare, because it happens in REM sleep, you're semi-paralyzed, you're not moving. But night terrors, these people can throw punches, they can scream and yell, they get up, they do things. And the reason that this occurs is still sort of questionable. We're not exactly certain why it does, but it can occur. Uh, again, we're going to see a video on Tuesday that's going to kind of cover some of the stuff. But unfortunately, it's most common in childhood, and it scares the bejeebies out of parents when kids do this. But it will go away generally. Um, you may also find that kids will not only have night terrors, but um, they also will tend to get up and try to get dressed or go out of the house when they're little. Quite often it's because they're worried about something and something's coming up or they're very excited about something and they're trying to get that done. So if you have a kid who tends to be doing this, either night walking or having night terrors, you should of course report this to your doctor, but you also wanna make sure maybe your locks on your doors and things are higher than their heads. I always address sleep apnea because this is far more dangerous than people tend to know about. We are having more and more people in the United States die of sleep apnea than we've ever had before. And the primary reason is, is because we are a heavier and heavier population of people. Unfortunately, here at Kaiser University, several years back, we actually had a student die of sleep apnea um, here on campus. They didn't die on campus. They were a student here on campus. They died in their bed. Um, the the big thing with sleep apnea for weight gain is because of the amount of weight that we have around our throat. People are getting very heavy around their throat and so that weight is pushing down when they go to sleep and their airways are not staying open. How do you know you have sleep apnea? Well, if your friend tells you that you tend to snore a great deal, that may be snoring, but if you're snoring and gasping for breath, then you probably have sleep apnea because you stopped breathing so you wake up to gasp. You may not fully wake up, so you may not even realize that you have sleep apnea. One of the biggest things that you can do to determine this is, of course, tell your doctor and go through a sleep test. But you also might want to tell your doctor if you find that you've gotten a full night's sleep. I mean, you know you went to sleep 
and you got nine hours of sleep and yet you're still exhausted in the morning. You still find yourself falling asleep all day long. And the reason that you may be falling asleep is that you never really got good sleep because with sleep apnea, you keep waking up. So you never get this kind of sort of continuous sleep. So that can be another sign of sleep apnea. There are some surgeries that they can be done. They'll tell you to lose some weight. But one of the biggest things right now is this air pressure a mask that they'll put on you and when you sleep with this air pressure mask what it does is it helps keep the airways open and you're able to sleep and breathe it's a good thing to breathe SIDS is an unfortunate um, aspect that we have to talk about SIDS is sudden infant death syndrome now up until recently we really looked at SIDS as um, being primarily caused by babies who were suffocating themselves. And that's because people would put their kids on their stomach to sleep. Kids like to curl up sort of in that ball. They put them face down. Unfortunately, the kids were dying of carbon monoxide poisoning or they were actually suffocating because they couldn't get oxygen because the way that the baby's face is made, we have a very flat nose when we're a baby. And so we would begin to basically put ourselves into a pillow or into a mattress and boom, we weren't getting any air. Once we started putting babies on their back, we found that SIDS deaths really dramatically shot down. And I don't mean just like a little bit, I mean dramatically shot down. I still hear people who say, well, I'm so afraid they're going to throw up and they're going to die from the throw up. No, they don't. They put their heads to the side. They push it out of their mouth, um, but they don't tend to die from that. However, there still are SIDS deaths where um, investigate every SIDS death that does occur. Quite often we'll find is that they have what we call a weak arousal reflex. So when they begin to go to sleep, if they sleep very deeply, they'll not arouse themselves enough to go ahead and take a breath. There are monitors that they'll send home with kids who have sleep apnea and the monitor will go off and alert you and alert the kid and just maybe wake the kid up enough so they get through it. The good thing is, is that if we have a child who does suffer from this, um, they tend to grow out of it once they get just a little bit bigger. So we can get them through the first couple of months, they do tend to grow out of it. Hypnosis. Um, as I say the very first day of class, I like to be a little bit of a myth buster. So I look at hypnosis and we address what is real and not real about hypnosis. And the first question is, is hypnosis real? Yes, it is real. And one reason we know it is real is because there is a change in the brainwave pattern. We know that when you're hypnotized versus waking consciousness, there is a different wave brain pattern. As such, it is an altered state. So hypnosis is an altered state. What is hypnosis? Well, basically it's characterized by this narrowing of attention that we have and this openness to suggestions. So I get very narrow in what I'm paying attention to or what kind of comes through and I'm easily suggested on different things. So we're going to look at what hypnosis is and what it can't do. So in reality, people have to want to be hypnotized in order for hypnosis to work. I cannot hypnotize somebody who doesn't want to. The other thing is, is that I can't make them carry out something that they wouldn't do normally. So I can't make you go kill somebody. I can't make you go and take your top off and flash everybody. I cannot do that. The other thing is, is that maybe not everybody can be hypnotized. There are scales on the suggestibility of somebody, how easily or uneasily they can be hypnotized. And in some cases, we may have to work with somebody over several sessions before hypnosis really can work. But in other cases, it can work right away. So let's address the three things that we know hypnosis can do for you. First of all, is that it can increase your memory. Unfortunately, it can increase both true and false memories. And the reason it can increase false memories is that, remember, we're open to suggestions. And depending on the way that I phrase the question, I may be actually adding false information in there. So let's say that I'm ask, I've am i hypnotized you and I'm asking you about a car accident that you saw when you were standing at the corner of NASA and Babcock with your back to Kaiser University and you're looking out. Tell me about that car accident. 
Well, I've already suggested an enormous amount of stuff to you. I've suggested it's at Kaiser. I've suggested it's at this corner. I've suggested that it's a car, not a truck. And so if your memory isn't strong in the first place, you're going to fill in with that information that I just gave you. Now, the reason that this is important is that today, many states will not allow somebody who's been hypnotized to actually testify in a court of law because of the problem of false memories. So if you're going to be going to court and somebody wants to hypnotize you to help you get a better sense of memory from this, just say no. You can always do it afterwards. Now it is true that hypnosis can bring back memories. It can help people remember things, but maybe not dramatically like we see on the TV shows. The two big things that hypnosis really can do is produce a change in senses and reduce pain. Now the change in senses is kind of interesting because what happens is, is when I'm first taught the smell of a rose, I store that in my brain. And then if I ask you to think about a rose and think about the smell of that rose, you actually are accessing that part of the brain where the storage is and bringing it forward. When I present you a rose, you may be actually accessing again the storage where you have that sensation and bringing it forward. So if I give you a rotten fish and I say this smells like a rose, you're accessing the storage where the pretty rose smell is and you're bringing that forward. We can also change your perception a little bit about hot and cold and pressure and things like this. What is really nice is you can put that along with pain reduction and this can really help people who can't use anesthesia to um, or can't have anesthesia because they're allergic to it during surgeries. So we have people who will go to entire surgeries, maybe not open heart surgery, but things like C-sections and other things through the use of both hypnosis and acupuncture. The two of those work together very well to reduce pain. We'll talk a little bit more about those in class, but basically we have these pain gates which regulate um, information going to the pain and we basically block the pain gate. So what hypnosis can't do? Well, the first thing is it cannot make you superhuman strong. It's only going to make you as strong as you normally are. Generally, the reason that we stop something when we talk about strength is because it hurts. With hypnosis, since I can reduce your pain, it may feel like you can lift more because you're not feeling pain. But the truth is, is that we hear all the time about a mom who picks up a car to take a kid out from underneath it, or a firefighter who holds up a wall so people can get out. We can still do those things, and adrenaline is basically going to be the thing that helps us achieve those superhuman strength goals. So we don't need hypnosis to do it. It's not going to make us any stronger than if we don't have it. Produce true age regression? Well, of course not. It can't. Nothing can age regress you. Why? Because you don't have the brain of a three-year-old anymore. Your brain is that of a far more sophisticated adult. A three-year-old brain is small, it's smooth, it's not wrinkly. So how can I get you to be a three-year-old again when your brain isn't going to be three years old again? What hypnosis may do is allow you to sort of get in touch with that inner child and allow you to feel more free to act like a three-year-old. But you can also listen to people who are pretending to be three and they have this vocabulary of maybe a 20-year-old. Maybe they don't quite have the vocabulary of the 30-year-old, but they're sure talking a lot more sophisticated than a normal three-year-old would talk. And we've already said that it cannot make you do something that you would not want to do. It cannot um, force you to do something that is against your morals. For me, my favorite are the stage hypnotists. I love stage hypnotists. They supposedly um, hypnotize people and they get them to do all these things. First of all, they very rarely hypnotize somebody. And the stage hypnotists that I've talked to have said the key here is to be able to pick the right people. Almost everybody when I talk about stage hypnotists kind of know what's going to go on in the show. They're probably going to cluck like a chicken or they're going to um, do something else that's kind of odd, you might want to say. One reason then that hypnotists will only take volunteers is that if you're volunteering to do this, you already know what's going to go on. So you know what's going to go on. And since most of you have never been hypnotized, you're not really certain if you were, you weren't hypnotized. And so the stage hypnotist is going to lead you through a series of small exercises. And those who do not cooperate the exercises, they basically get thrown off. They get dismissed. You aren't really hypnotized or this isn't going to work and so they kind of take you out. 
The thing is, is that once you've been on stage for a while, and you know, we're talking about 15, 20 minutes, one of the things that's very hard is for you to suddenly sit up and say, hey, I'm not hypnotized and I'm not doing this anymore. For most of us, there's a fear factor that jumps in at that point. And so we wouldn't do that in the first place. And if I'm a good stage hypnotist, I'm going to try to see if I can figure out the people who are going to be like that anyway, and I'm going to toss them out. Watch most stage hypnotists and you can find that they control the audience members that they pick. That's the key. Now the chapter ends with drugs. Um, we are just going to cover a couple of basic things about drugs. First of all, you should understand that there are three basic categories of drugs. Psychoactive drugs, those are the ones that are going to work on our perception of things. So things like LSD, marijuana, those tend to be more your psychiatric drugs. They tend to alter our attention. Stimulants tend to increase our body activity and depressants tend to decrease our body activities. So we talk about things like caffeine as being a stimulant. Depressant, actually alcohol is a depressant. You'll see this chart in your book. Um, they show you here the group of stimulants and they show you down here a group of depressants. The sad thing is, is that no matter which way you go, we die. Either we pop or we forget to breathe. Um, these are kind of interesting for you to see. You can see cocaine, a large dose, is a very strong stimulant. Um, barbiturates is a strong depressant. One of the problems with barbiturates is that they also tend to make us forgetful. And so people can't remember if they did or didn't take the pill. And so they take another pill because they can't remember if they took a pill. And then I really can't remember if I took a pill. And then I take another pill. And the next thing you know, we're drying, dying of a drug overdose. Um, Marilyn Monroe is probably one of the most famous people to die from a barbiturate overdose. River Phoenix, who was a, an actor, died of a barbiturate overdose. There have been several other people who have died of barbiturate overdoses. Um, we don't offer barbiturates too much anymore. Physical dependency versus psychological dependency on drugs. A physical dependency means that we actually have a body dependency and that without the drug, we are going to suffer negatively. And so what's happened with a withdrawal symptom is that our body at this point has become reliant on the drug and without that drug, we find discomfort. And the only way to get rid of that discomfort is to take the drug again. Psychological dependency doesn't mean that I really need the drug physically, but I feel like I need the drug psychologically. Cocaine is a great example of one that has a psychological dependency far more than a physical dependency. In fact, for most people, if you stop using cocaine, there is no withdrawal symptoms, but that feel like I need it. I need to feel that sensation that it gives me is there. The other one that can quite often be there um, with a very strong psychological dependency, although it does have somewhat of a physical dependency, is also ecstasy because it can make us feel so much happier than we'd normally be. Um, my normal state of happiness will never be as great as the happiness I'm going to feel on ecstasy. Two of the drug issues that we have to look at is first is drug interactions. And that's where we take two different drugs and by themselves they may be perfectly fine and normal, but when we mix the drugs they tend to enhance the effect and what we could do is find a fatal overdose can occur or some other unfortunate problems can occur. A great example of this was a drug called Fen and another drug called Fen and we call them Fenfen. Now, originally, both drugs were tested by the FDA and both drugs were safe to use. And both drugs are still safe to use. However, what happened is, is do some doctors began to find when they prescribed them together, Fen and Fen, that they became a great appetizer suppressant and that people who were overweight were really beginning to lose weight. Now, one of the problems with people who are overweight, not everybody, but for many people, is the intense craving for food all the time. They're always hungry. You may find that you eat a big meal and you think, ah, oh, you know, I've eaten this big meal, I can't eat again for a year. Many people who suffer from being overweight can eat a big meal and they're not satisfied. And they should be satisfied. They even know they should be satisfied. They even know if they shoved another piece of food in their gut that they're going to throw up because they've got so much food in their gut, but yet their brain is not saying they're satisfied. And so they are always looking for something to make them feel satisfied. Not food, but maybe a drug can help me. And so this Fen Fen was 
brought forward. And it really, really helped a lot of people who had that issue. Unfortunately, it also began to cause heart valve problems. And these people began to suffer from heart attacks after a sustained use of FenFen. Drug interactions, we also have to understand, happen with more than just prescription drugs. One of the things that we always want to make sure is that we understand what a drug is. A drug is anything that changes your body chemistry. And so my friends who are pharmacists always say the same thing. People underestimate the power of over-the-counter drugs, including things like vitamins, things you might get from the health food store, and things such as Benadryl. These are all drugs and they can interact with both prescription and non-prescription medication you may be taking. One of the things that most of the pharmacists have always said to me is that there are two hints they give to everybody. One is always get all your drugs filled at the same drugstore chain. So if you go to Walmart, get all your drugs filled at Walmart. If you go to Walgreens, get all your drugs filled at Walgreens. In part is because those pharmacists and those systems will flag if you have two drugs that are interaction of themselves. Basically meaning is that one drug might hurt you if you take it alongside with this other drug. Now this can become very easy to occur to you because you may be going to two or three different doctors. So let's say you go to your GP and then you go to an endocrinologist because you're beginning to develop diabetes and maybe you go to a cardiologist because you have some sort of arrhythmia. Now all of a sudden you've got drugs from all three doctors and the doctors don't know what the other one is prescribing or you've forgotten to tell them that you've just gotten this new drug. If you go to the same pharmacist, luckily the pharmacist generally something will pop up on the screen and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, these two drugs should not be mixed together. The other thing that pharmacists will always say is that when you do go to your doctors, you must bring a list of everything that you take. That includes if you take things like ginkgo or if you take other health food or um, alternative medications. Those are still drugs and they are still medication. Some vitamins such as vitamin C or vitamin D can affect the usefulness of other drugs. In some cases if you're taking something like a blood thinner and then you take ginkgo on top of it, well ginkgo also happens to be a blood thinner so now I'm thinning my blood too much. So when they ask if you take anything else, they are asking if you drink caffeine or if you take vitamin A or you take just a general over-the-counter medication like a I don't know, an all-in-one vitamin. They need to know that to make sure there's no drug interactions. All drug tolerance says is that basically my body begins to get used to a drug and now I need to increase the amount of drug I take to get the same effect. So it's sort of like with the barbiturates where we begin to get used to taking one pill, one pill doesn't work anymore so now we take two pills and as we begin to tr build up these drug tolerances we either need to change the drug or we need to take a larger amount. Anybody who's got a kid who is on some of the ADA, ADHD medications, we can find that gr kids will begin to build up a tolerance to that drug and we need to switch out of that drug. That's again why you want to go to the same pharmacist and allow your pharmacist to know that maybe this is or isn't working for you and they may begin to be able to research for you. By the way, pharmacists, you should get a good relationship with them. They can really be extremely helpful to let you know about your drugs. You know, they always say, do you need to know anything about your drugs today? And people walk away all the time saying, no, I don't need to know anything. And yet they do need to know things, especially things like what happens if I miss a dose? Should I take it right away or should I wait? You know, when I, when shouldn't I? Those kind of things, uh, you just ask your pharmacist and they're really going to be very good at knowing that. I often s ask people what the number one drug in the world is and it is caffeine. Um, people don't think you can get addicted to caffeine. Oh, absolutely you can. I love people who tell me, well, I mean, I'm not addicted to caffeine. I can have a cup or two, in fact, of coffee before I go to bed and it actually helps me go to sleep. Well, that's because you were suffering withdrawal symptoms. Um, it can be hazardous to pregnant women. It can cause birth defects. So we ask you to reduce the amount of caffeine you have. Also, you have to remember that if you are somebody who has any kind of a heart issue or can't use stimulants, caffeine is a stimulant. Our biggest problem is, is that we don't know where caffeine is in most cases. You cannot assume a food is caffeine free unless it says it is caffeine free. We have hot sauces that have caffeine in it. We have cereals that have caffeine in it. Anything that's got chocolate in it, 
has got caffeine in it. So always check with your doctor and you might even have to call the actual food manufacturers to find out if that food that you're eating does or does not include caffeine. Because it is labeled as a drug and not a food product, it quite often is not listed in the list of ingredients. That's the end of this lecture. It's kind of a short lecture today. We're going to talk a little bit about some of this stuff in class and hopefully you are awake. If not, wake up! Eh, I think I'll be Garfield and go find a pillow. Bye-bye.